Hello, it's Scott Manley here with part four of Galileo Conquest, and we are rethinking our strategies. We've installed the Strategia mod, and I am going to take this IOTA probes option. So this will be, you can only have one of these programs going at once, and it gives you all sorts of bonuses to funds and milestones. And of course, those two programs are run by Werner and Gene. I kind of wish they'd bring uh, Bobak Kerman back into the game. I liked him. So here we are with Project Richard, Project Dick, uh, specifically a reference to Dick Byrne, if you know what I'm talking about. That's just the name, the, the next name that came up on NamingSchemes.com, a great resource for naming your spaceships. Anyway, this is designed to burn all the way into Mooner Orbit. Not Mooner Orbit, it's not the moon, it's Iota, Iocean Orbit. Yes, this is going to be an unmanned space probe as part of my unmanned space probe program. Uh, basically, I've started using the Strategia mod, and one of the things I've selected is the IOTA program, the unmanned, the uncrewed IOTA program. So here we go, starts out with a single solid rocket booster to forward the initial stage. That will bring us up into the upper atmosphere, and 40 seconds after liftoff, this second engine, the LV-909, kicks in, and this is enough to carry us most of the way, to be honest. We have a lot of Delta V inside this, and we're just going to use it to bring us all the way out to IOTA. Now, it's worth noting that in the Galileo system, on Gale, the main launch site is not on the equator. So regardless of when I launch, I am going to have to perform a plane change maneuver to get me out there. But let's, let's deploy everything, fold it all out so we can get a good look at the spacecraft to see how, how pretty the darn thing looks. Look at this, we have these big antenna that will help us communicate over long, long distances. We have solar panels, and we of course have a radar array. The radar array is actually an interesting choice for a low-end uh, survey system in Scansat, because radar survey systems are actually kind of rare in terms of space exploration. Radars were certainly used on landers to make sure they triggered at the right time, but they weren't really used to survey the moon from spacecraft for a long time. I think, uh, you know, you had to wait until the 80s or 90s before we had any missions that were actually surveying the surface of the moon. They were used to survey the surface of uh, Venus and Titan, and of course, the Earth. In those cases, we're of course trying to penetrate through cloud layers to collect information. Now, the laser-based version, LiDAR, is actually being used a lot more. Of course, it's fine shooting through, uh, looking at airless worlds because it doesn't have to worry about the clouds. But radar is actually really useful because you can use it to penetrate the ground. You have ground-penetrating radars deployed on a couple of lunar observing spacecraft. Anyway, look, I'm skipping through a lot of this because, hey, you know, you've seen me travel to a mysterious world before. It seems pretty easy. Just line up the spacecraft, time accelerate away, watch Gale, not Kerbin, spin around underneath me as I disappear up into its outer, outer orbit, and actually start falling back down, and bingo! And now with our first steps into a new sphere of influence, we have new temperature scanning information. Measuring the temperature of space appears to be impossible, and we've read all this before. The atmospheric pressure scan is also telling us it's a vacuum. Good God, who would have thought that being in orbit in space around another world would also be in vacuum? Now, since this is performing a survey of the surface, I want to put it into a perfect polar orbit so that none of the planet, none of the moon, will be missed. I know that looks like the, the North Pole, but it is in fact the South Pole. It's just the camera angles. The thermometer leaks, or maybe it drools. Uh-huh. The instrument reads zero, it's as if it were in a vacuum. Also, it's as if this planet is somehow, this planetoid, this moon, because moon is a planetoid, is somehow, has some strange geometric surface near its poles. It's almost as if it's been painted on by hand and then wrapped. Could this strange symmetrical geometric structure at the poles perhaps be a sign of some sort of alien intelligence? Well, we will use our radar system to analyze IOTA and find out. So yeah, I was saying that having the radar as the base level is kind of silly because radar is a lot more capable than LiDAR. 
I should also point out that the first radar surveys of the moon were actually done from Earth and you can get topographic information from that. But maybe the Kerbals live in a universe where they haven't developed all that fancy radar technology and instead they're just using an altimeter type device thing to collect the topography all over the planet. So yes, we're in orbit. That's a rather beautiful orbit if I do say so myself. Uh, we're just going to do that. We have to actually remain above a certain altitude, I believe. And now we're going to start surveying. We're hoping to get 75% of this, and this may take several days. So, back to the R&D lab to spend our science. And the obvious place to spend our science is on the TB75M telescope, a part of research bodies that is essentially required for me to investigate planets further afield. If you remember, I have not been able to show you very much of the Galileo system because we simply don't know what is out there. We need to unlock that using this telescope and the other in, the other stuff that we have here. So we get a... My curiosity demands that I start looking at other planets. So Operation Cyril's philosophy is... Well, to just stack everything really, really tall. The upper stage does need to be quite... Oh, wait, we've picked up some spin here. And we picked up some wobble. Quick, quick. Uh, what do we should do? No, that's it. Come, shut, shut the thing. Okay, stability control is doing something weird here. Stability control is inducing a spin, which is not what I want to have happening. I'm wondering if I put the wings on backwards. No, they look just fine here. It's not clear what's causing it just yet, but what is clear is that because of that early emergency, I am taking a rather steep ascent path into orbit. I may, may have to adjust my profile, so I shut down the main engine, and of course when stability control is turned on, this thing starts spinning up again. So let's disable roll control in these wings. I, I don't know what's going on there. That is very frustrating, but actually it's pretty useful to disable roll control on these fins. There's very rarely is you need roll control on these. Anyway, the first stage is expended with a 900 meters per second of velocity gained. Second stage kicks in and at 40 kilometers we ditch the fairing and hopefully that will bring it into orbit without getting too much you know, too many bugs on the, the lenses of the camera. That would be really unfortunate if we hit a bug at 40 kilometers altitude. I mean, sure, it would really suck for the bug, but it would also ruin our nice telescope. And can you imagine the headlines? It would be like, New Space Telescope has a few bugs. Ah, 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 ah. Okay, never mind. I have to say, that is one of the things that Kerbal Space Program does not have in the modding scene. There's a great many mods, but I don't think there's a mod which has bugs splattering on your windshield when you're flying through Kerbin's atmosphere, or Gale's atmosphere, as the case may be. Would also be cool to see, like, localized splash damage where you hit things like, well, Kerbals, to be honest, because those are the only living things that you're going to hit. Leave, like, a green splot on the, the hull if you hit them going too fast. So I foolishly added an upper stage to this that used regular fuel, not actually reading the instructions and realizing that it has plenty of monopropellant on board. However, as it turned out, well, as it turned out that I lost the rest of the footage, but I did ultimately get it into a nice 277 kilometer orbit, which is high enough for it to work. So what we're going to do here is we bring up the research bodies menu and we have to target a body. Now, I have installed the 1.9 beta version that is on the thread because I've been told that things aren't perfectly working with the stock version. I target the object in the inner solar system. I line up using the nav ball. And then you, once you've got it perfectly on there, you're supposed to hit track bodies. Well, once, hit it again, hit it again. Nope, and it, none of these are actually going to give me any results because something broke. Well, while I wait on the developer to fix that mod, I do have four known bodies to explore, so it's not a huge disaster. 
But one of my contracts does require returning scientific data, or rather a spacecraft with scientific data from the surface of IOTA. IOTA being of course the first moon of Gale. So that's what Project Jim is all about. However, before we actually send a spacecraft to the moon, we're going to run some tests. Remember, we're not using simulations. Every single flight has to be done in the game with actual game fun. So I'm running this launch just to see that the re-entry system will protect it. So we have a solid rocket booster, we have a second stage booster that should get it to pretty high velocities. And I'm just trying to turn the whole thing over so that we can get going sideways rather than upwards. Now we've run out of fuel, but we hold on to this stage for a few seconds because the extra mass helps in terms of drag. Now we're ready to stage! Oh dear. That was not what I intended to have happen there. It appears... Uh, yeah, okay. Crap. <laughs> I panicked and I staged more than once after the first failure. And it appears that I am stuck to the fairing. Well, the rest of my spacecraft kind of floats away with all the science gear. That's great. Oh, science. So, for future reference, check your staging. But in the name of science, let us complete this mission. Uh, we don't actually have any science to collect. Now we're falling down through the atmosphere. We're not going fast enough because the second stage never ignited. You do notice some damage to the heat shield there. Not that that's going to matter because the wings on this on the upper stage are pretty much going to keep it going the wrong direction. So the heat shield isn't going to get troubled at all. I mean, the real question is, will we collect any science at all from this? Will we recover any debris? Who knows? We've slowed down enough that we can't actually fire the parachute. This tiny little parachute will do its best to bring the whole spacecraft down. And I will point out, this does look pretty large. But it is empty. <laughs> Look at this thing spinning. Do not get near this thing. It's like a giant mace of death. Could you imagine like medieval warfare taken into the space age where you have maces swinging around to hit other spacecraft? I guess actually that's Kerbal Space Program, isn't it? I mean, seriously, who hasn't built medieval weapons in Kerbal Space Program? I still need to do that jousting challenge, don't I? Okay, let's see how this jousts with respect to the surface of the ocean. Whoa! Whoa! Wow! Is it, it... It... It survived! My goodness! I don't know what the science is, but I don't expect it was gonna survive. And now we're on to the second test of Jim with fixed staging and an improved second stage. Also, I popped up science here and now early on so I could actually start doing research while we're flying. So here we go, materials study. Some of the materials fall out and quickly van- Whoa, what the heck? Imminent failure on AVR8 winglet. Which one? What, what the heck? What's going on? Oh, that's one of the failure things. No! The entire mission is going to fail now because of that. Not really. Nice, look, it's forming a second trail there. That's so, that looks so awesome. Look at it. Parallel trails. Anyway, despite that failure, we are on a much better trajectory this time. So yeah, if you have a big heavy stage, it's actually good to have as much mass as possible when you're still flying through the atmosphere, assuming your cross section is correct. So this is, uh, this is actually a trick that's used by real rockets. They will hold on to uh, stages until they need to fire them sometimes to reduce drag issues. There we go. Now this one fires. This is just a little solid rocket booster here to add a bit more speed. We're not expecting to do amazing things. We got materials, study, collected, and stowed. The whole idea is we're going to detach those materials bays. The bay malfunctions and shatters a glass, and no doubt because of the rough ride caused by the previous hardware malfunction. I'm going to have to talk to quality control about that. Okay, so we have all our science. We can now move it into the science container. All items saved. And I guess we're now at altitude, so there's no point. I guess the only reason to hang on to the, this stage is for solar, but we're going to be fine because we have batteries. So now 
We're going to head back into the atmosphere and see whether this thing is aerodynamically stable. That's the important thing. I know the heat shield can handle it, but if this design wanted to flip around the other way, then we would lose all our hard-earned science. So I want to test that before we go into space. Go to, the, go to the moon? Go to Iota! Iota, which is the moon, the first moon, a moon. Nice! Whoa, yes! Oh, this is... Look at that. Re-entry! Watching my fellow re-entry bros who can't take the heat and should stay out of the kitchen. Yes. There we go, heading down, collecting more science. This might actually give us enough to unlock another node, who knows? A node, a node who knows? There we go, open the parachute. There's the ground, will it open in time? Yeah, so I'm gonna have to do this for a lot of my components, like, I, I can't rely on... I have to do re-entry stability, that's one of the things I literally cannot do without an actual test. But anyway, we get there, we collect the data, and yes, we have 131, so it's time to take a further look at the tech tree. And people keep asking about the tech tree, so this is the unmanned before manned, and one of the things that happened, by the way, is that in an update recently, they moved the mystery goo to precision engineering, so I can't use that anymore. This is uh, electrics, we get some more antennas there. No new science, docking stuff could be nice. Um, simple command modules could be useful for rescues, I guess. Um, I'm just trying to figure out what to unlock. Advanced flight control gives us some more probe bodies and stuff, which is nice. And loading ramps, because, what? wait, that's a, for flight control? Are people going to use it as a flap? Uh, landing stuff, inflatable airbags, could be useful. I don't know if I want to use airbags, to be honest, because I'm pretty good at landing things. We have heavy rocketry that gives me access to 2.5 meter rocket engines. Oh, and carbonite fueled engines. We have uh, propulsion systems, which gives me smaller things. And this is the thing that gives me access to the 2.5 meter tank. So no point in unlocking this. No point in unlocking the engines if I can't unlock the tanks. And this is advanced construction. Oh, recycling bins. I'm guessing you just put those on the back and throw your empty cans, as in rocket tanks inside them. I don't know, and what... Uh, let me just see. Should I go for electrics? Electrics are usually helpful because you can do relays and things like that. Or... I don't know, storage technology. I'm not really using the storage just yet. Look, realistically, I want to get some hardware to the moon, so we're probably going to need the bigger engines, but we need the bigger fuel tanks first, so we're going to go for the bigger fuel systems. That's what I ultimately decided to do. Anyway, uh, that's the end of the episode. I'll be back with another one sometime soon. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.